Yeah, did we understand how young Big was? Did we understand? Yeah, we both look like we saw ghosts because we didn't expect to see Pac bandaged up. Once it was over, he goes, Preem, it's over. Just like that. He goes, I'm the greatest. 26 years ago, we tragically lost one of the greatest music artists that ever lived. In the sphere of hip hop, Christopher Wallace, AKA the Notorious B.I.G., is revered as one of the greatest of all time writer, rapper, and songwriters, a GOAT. His final body of work was the impeccable double album, Life After Death, a succession of infectious hit records and impossibly poignant rhymes that soared from certified diamond to iconic. 2022 marked the year that Life After Death turned 25, as well as the year that our dear friend Big Papa would have been 50 years old. I'm Angie Martinez, The Voice of New York, and I spent five consecutive nights speaking with those who were closest to Biggie during the final 18 months of his life, in and out of the studio. The result is an eight-episode visual podcast fit for a king. Welcome to season one of Iconic Records. The Life After Death song that had the most cultural impact is the indelible Ten Crack Commandments. The three minute and 24 second track produced by DJ Premier was a YouTube tutorial before the internet was a thing. Big's black market advisory transcended the drug game and smartened up entrepreneurs from cold street corners to plush corner offices. On episode four of Iconic Records, we speak with the legendary Primo on making the iconic track. Rick Ross and Pusha T also joined the convo to discuss how much Biggie influenced their coke rap careers. But first, Kleptomaniac returns to tell us how street hustling bonded him and Big, and eventually led to him hanging out with superstars like Nas and Tupac Shakur. When did he um, break down the vision, or how did he break down the vision, and what did you think about the vision for Junior Mafia? I thought I thought it was dope. Mm. I thought it was dope because, like I said, he... Um, my timing was like impeccable because he didn't have all every, it, they, they didn't even start recording yet. They yeah. didn't even have, it was like in, in talks, but hoping to execute it. Mm -hmm. So he told me who Kim was. He told me it was, it was originally me, Kim as a solo artist, me as a solo artist. It was, it was C's. C's, um, Cheek Del Vec, and somebody else was the Sixes. Was it Nino? It was the Sixes, and then they had the Snakes, which was Trife and Larceny. So if you look at the back of the first single, you see how they had it separated. Mm -hmm. So that was the original plan. So, um, yeah. And everybody's younger than you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Everybody yeah. was younger than me. Yeah, so, and, and I think that's one of the main reasons me and him got to go around a lot, because I'm not 100% sure if everybody could have gotten into clubs. No, the difference with you and Junior Mafia is, you know, he, he grew up with C's and right. Kim. and So how was that introduction made? And then what did you make of his relationship with them? And right. back, back then, I was in a different mindset, because I, I was in the streets. Like, I was, I was hustling. Mm -hmm. Like, I was always, like, doing my own thing and self-sufficient. So I didn't, like, when he brought me in, it, you know how it is, like, and, and it's real now. Those are my brothers, like, like we all love each other. But you know how it is when you're young and they bring somebody new into your circle. Mm -hmm. They're like, yo, who this? Like, like no, you're, you're not, there's no, like, arms and hugs. Like, hey, Clef, welcome to the gang, yo. Yeah. God, come on, yeah, Clef is family now. So it wasn't, it wasn't any of that. And I knew that because I was from the streets. And then they didn't like the fact that, me and Big were going everywhere. Like, we were going everywhere yeah. together. So, I think Did that, Big manage that? Did he get involved? We were young. Like, so it was just, we just, like, went with the flow of whatever it was. And then I was in the, I was in the streets doing what I had to do. Like, and, and that was something where me and him, we always had love, but there wasn't, 
that latch in because I was so stuck in the street mentality. I couldn't just leave and pop off and go on tour with him. Like, cause he wanted me, like his first tour, he wanted me to come on tour. Like, and, and that was another thing. Like when he first came out, he wanted us to get an apartment together. But I was in my own zone and I was like, man, I don't really want to get an apartment because I know dude's going to be here waking up 8 o'clock in the morning the next day, like like 15 people. And I'm like, yo, that ain't going to work <laughs> for, for how I move. So, But I think everything played out the way it should have. But, I mean, I'm happy with the way everything went because it, it worked out. It worked out for me. Let's talk about this album. First of all, no Junior Mafia on this album, which right. you would have maybe thought. Right. Was there a reason for that? Was there ever a conversation about it? Puff really cared about big stuff. He didn't really care about Junior Mafia. And and you can see that. I, I love I love the locks and Jada Kiss, those are my boys. But you can see that from We Always Love Big Papa when Biggie passed away. Mm. Like, you would think, like, you try to get together and get Junior Mafia or somebody, even if it's not all of us, you, you're still doing stuff with Kim. Yeah. He gravitated to Kim because Kim's star was so bright you had no choice, yeah. but you had no choice. Like you couldn't deny her star. What did you make about how crazy things got between Big and Pac? I knew the relationship that they had, like that Big and Pac had with each other. Big had a world of respect for him. And I felt like Pac had the same. Like when you see them together, they're, they're dudes like, yo, they're, they're <laughs> You're like this guy from trying to get on and you're hanging out with Big yeah, and Pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, wow, I'm, I'm in this world. And, and I'm like, I'm looking at it from a fan's perspective, but I'm being pulled into the world. Mm -hmm. So I remember this is how much I knew Big had a lot of respect for Pac and also looked up to Pac. Because back in those days, we didn't have digital cameras we had disposable cameras the one you like kind of do all of this you <laughs> yeah you buy it in thing. the store yeah, yeah 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 so we had the disposable cameras and one time we went and picked up Nas and met Nas in Queensbridge and I like I said I'm still mad to this day because there's a picture with Big and Nas in the red jacket and somebody cut me out of that picture and it's like all over the internet but, disrespectful yeah that, like, whoever did that Thousand curses to you. The original, but, uh, the original Diddy crop. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and Diddy was there too. He was in that that photo. So now, when we were going to meet Pop, Big was like, "Yo, don't bring your disposable camera." <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, "All right," and I'm pissed because to this day, I'll tell you why I wish I had that disposable camera. So now we're going to meet Pop. So me and Big, we jump in my car, we go over the bridge. And Pac is at the Park of Meridian. So we go meet him and we go up to Pac's room. So when we get up to Pac's room, Pac opens the door and all over the whole floor is just composition notebook papers, like with lyrics, just like, I don't know what the hell he was doing or like he just wrote stuff and was like, nah, I don't like that. And just, I swear to God, it looked like snow. <laughs> on the floor, I never saw anything like this. It looks like it looked like snow on the floor with just sheets of paper all over. So I'm 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 tripping. So now I see a light flickering through the corner of my eye. So I'm like, what the hell is this light flickering? So when I look over to the corner of the, my eye, it's candles and a shrine in the corner. So he had a a a shrine with Madonna's picture behind it so he had candles with madonna's picture behind it because that's when and then next thing they showed that he was dating madonna so were you surprised when it went so bad yeah definitely it's because when Pac got shot we went me and biggie went down in the elevator i think it was me big and it might have been nino brown or c's it was three of us i can't remember who was the third person but when we went down in the elevator in Quad Studio, how it unfolded is in Quad Studio, there's a ledge outside where you can see downstairs to the street. Mm -hmm. So while we're in there doing the album, everybody goes out to the ledge and they start smoking out there. And then C's comes in and says, yo, Pac downstairs, yo, Pac downstairs. Like he's hyped, like happy, like yo, Pac downstairs. Yo, 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 I'm gonna, yo, Pac, yo, he yelling to Pac like back and forth, yo, yo, yo. So now he leaves out with Nino, I, I believe it was, to go downstairs to go check pot. So now we just chilling in the studio writing. So probably about 
five or so minutes later, they come back up like, yo, got Pac, Pac laid down in the, in the thing. Because apparently when the elevator opened and they think they pointed the gun at the elevator, I get the back in the elevator, mm -hmm. something along those lines. So now they came back up. So we we start freaking out. We all get up like, like oh, so we all walk to the elevator. And then by the time the elevator comes up, I, I never forget it. The elevator came up to the floor we were on. The elevator opens up. A police officer comes out and pokes his head. And then I can't remember if the police officer went back in and went up or whatever happened. So now me and Big, and I can't remember who it was. I, I would say Nino, but I, like I said, it could have been C's. I got to ask C's. But I think it was Nino. We get in the elevator and we go down. Me, Big, and Nino. So when the elevator door opens on the ground level, lobby level, all I see is clots of blood on the wall, blood smeared, and like clots of blood on the floor. So I'm looking at that, and while we're doing that, and we look over to the right, the, uh, might have, was it plain clothes or detectives? But police officers ran in, like, don't move, and had us all hemmed up, me, Big, and Nino, or C's again, downstairs in the lobby. So we were there for like about 15, just, just chilling. So in that amount of time, apparently, they were upstairs bandaging Pac up. So when Spice once said, yeah, Pac, when Pac opened the elevator, Big looked like he saw a ghost. Yeah, we both looked like we saw a fucking ghost because we didn't expect to see Pac bandaged up like imagine you hemmed up and you see blood clots on the floor all, all over the wall nobody told you what's happening all you see is blood imagine you go down in the lobby and you you see blood and then the cops come and say don't move so what was your reaction when you first heard hit him up man when i first heard hit him up i wanted to respond badly like it was it was crazy like i it, i wanted to respond so bad that i wanted to make it up Mm -hmm. But I'm glad it didn't go that way because then people would have never believed that we didn't have anything to do with it. But what did Big tell you? Like, what was his... He, he didn't even want to... He didn't even want to entertain it at all. Like, zero. And, and that was pissing me off, too, because I'm like, yo, he dissing the shit out of us. Like, I really, really, really wanted to just do something, but we just it's, left it alone. It's crazy because there's so many times where we hear how... You know, he liked the sport of like, he would take jabs at even your, who that's, shot that's your true. story. Yeah, that's true. He would take jabs at people. He liked the sport of that. But it's interesting that he would take this opportunity to say, to not Yeah, engage. and that's an interesting point that you just brought to my attention because I guess that shows, I think Big probably felt hurt by the situation because he knew, like, he had a lot of respect for that dude. Like, he, I, I saw it. Like, he had respect for him. Like, it was never, he, he, he probably until that, mo those moments, he had nothing bad to say. He looked up to Tupac. Like, I know that. Klepto wasn't the only hustler slash rapper that Big inspired. Pusha T has also gone on record admitting that he's borrowed Big's flow throughout his career. Just check out his verse on the clip song Trill and tell me you don't hear B.I.G. on Nasty Boy. Push. What's up, what's up? <laughs> good to see you, baby. Good to be here. How you doing? I'm good. Welcome to the biggie world that we've created for everybody to go awesome. down. It's pretty great, right? Nah, it looks awesome. Where were you when you first heard Life After Death? What was going on in your life and your world and what did it mean to you? Oh, my God. Um, life After Death. Um, let me start off by saying by far the best double album ever created ever ever made okay yes i don't i don't care i don't care what <laughs> happened it you nothing. said it there this it is, is you it. said it yes um i remember the anticipation for life after death big to me was already i was already you know you know ready to die crazy you know i'm already i'm already in right but what happened the summer of 96 on the mixtape circuit for Big set set us up, set the world up for life after death. And I mean, I don't think there was one person who was not awaiting um, this album after hearing 
what he did with the Bad Boy mixtapes, you know, where he just, man, he showed off. He went crazy. He was yes. rhyming next to the locks. He was rhyming next to Mace. He was rhyming next to everybody. And it was just like, you know, Big was light years beyond. You know, he, he always had these characters and he says he's Frank White and things like that. But it's when he actually turned into Frank White to me. You know, well, saying, explain like, that to me. Explain what you saw, um, what you witnessed. You know, on Ready to Die, you got the high tones from him and and the and the the character of like, um, you know, give me the loot and he, he would play with his vocals and things like that. Come '96, Big was mafioso, all business, all business, king of New York, all business. His posture, his tone, his everything. I remember even the, the that um that Alfred Hitchcock vibe cover was like. That, I mean, it was just iconic because mm -hmm. it just embodied how we saw him. We saw him as a boss and the flow was at all time boss levels come 96. Talk talk to me about like how we see, uh, you know, that Biggie DNA, even in your, you know, in your own work and just in your career and you as an artist. Yeah, I, t I you know, I, I tell people all the time that I have I have attempted to copy and mimic big at so many different points of my career <laughs> um um if you if you go back to um if you go back to um hell half no fury 2006 the clips album um you know double xl rated you know what i'm saying probably the most critically acclaimed album of our discography i am mimicking big one for one i'm trying my best <laughs> on records like on records like Mama, I'm so sorry. And I mean, just from tones and inflections, Mama, I'm so sorry. I'm so obnoxious. I don't fear tubs and crockett. Uh. Like I'm just, I'm at it. Like I'm I'm like, yo, I'm trying to channel this guy in every sense of the word. Even in Brambleton today, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's almost dry album. We was out in Brambleton up the pool got hit. Like all of these are big like cadences and like flows and inflections and just things that he did. I mean, he was like, he was so good with melody. People mm. talk about the lyricism, but no man, it is the melody that makes him special. It was the melody of those flows that made him special. And like, as a person, you know, it, and it was so unique that all you can, as an artist, all you can do is mimic it because that's something that you just have to have in you. That was his thing. No one has done it. You can play with your tone a little bit to try to, you know, get close. But it's the melodies that, like, still have been unmatched. You didn't mention Trill when you were talking about the songs. Oh, the, for the, sure. The DNA. Trill, of course. Mm -hmm. It's so many records. It's mm -hmm. so many records that I have taken the big cheat sheet you know from from in, in regard to my discography but for sure trill for sure can you talk to me about um just big's influence now 25 years later you know being that i'm still making music i'm still looking to try to make you know the classic album i'm still looking to try to always create that classic album i'm still trying to create um albums that have that depth that have skits and have things you know and 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 and, it, and even if i don't toy into the skits it's because he set such a high bar that i don't think that you know if it's not like really really produced i don't want to do it i feel like big for those who are album makers there's not one album album artist out here let's let's call ourselves album artists there's not one album artist out here who does not refer to that discography. I mean, you know, whether Life After Death, uh, specifically for me, or or Ready to Die, Big's imagination, his aspirational uh, point of view and flows, and like, I mean, he was he was rhyming. A, yo, he wanna he wanna push seven hundred. They ain't made them yet. He just always had a very aspirational view of like of what somebody who didn't have and what they wanted and what they were aspiring to get. That's something that I try to throw in my raps 
every single time. You got to say the flyest and in creating that feeling of aspiration and wealth and want and go get that's that's when you know that you're touching your fans like mm. big big will make you go buy a car like them raps <laughs> them raps will make you go outside <laughs> go get some money buy cars go spend some money on a woman <laughs> like it's gonna make you do it all he's gonna make he set the bar for like you know um just being like a go-getter it's amazing that all these years we still have that right yeah so here is a fun fact DJ Premier did not make the beat for 10 Crack Commandments for Biggie. He actually made it for me. This is a true story. Can't make it up. At one point, I almost forgot about it, but Primo did not. Primo! What up, Bans? Hi, my love. Have a oh, seat. Yeah. yeah. We look, did at the, all the, look at all the big... We, 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 we hug all the time. So. All the time. We <laughs> hugged twice earlier Good to today. See you. Good to see you, Always. my love. This is pretty great, right? Yeah, man. What is the first thing you think of when you see that artwork and that album right there? What is that? Uh, I haven't gotten my plaque, but... <laughs> <laughs> you never got a plaque? Not for Life After Death. I have Ready to Die, and the single, because uh, Unbelievable was on Juicy, so it was actually my first gold single I ever got. Really? Ever in my career. Wow. And then Puff called me to come pick up the, uh, the uh, uh, Ready to Die album plaque, and that's when we... Uh, we're starting to work on kicking the door for life after death. All right. Somebody's got to get you a plaque immediate, yep. immediately. Immediately. Mm -hmm. But Unbelievable is kind of a great one to have. Oh, yeah. That definitely. I mean, it, what, 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 a, what a memory. Did you look at him in, that early, in those early moments and think this guy's going to be great? You could just tell. You could tell. You could just tell. Mm -hmm. you, and everybody's telling me about him besides C. Uh, MOP's telling me about him. Even he says, you know, my fame up in Prospect, even though he's from St. Mark's, I remember we had a show with Big, and MOP is there, uh, and uh, we had performed with them. And Biggie's walking to the car, and Lil Fame's going, I ain't from Prospect, I'm from the Marks. And he goes, <laughs> I know that. Biggie's going, I know that. I know that, but it works with the record. Yeah, you know, and Prospect is in Brownsville, you know, yeah. but every Friday and Saturday became our normal hangout with all of them. You know, Group Home would be there, Jay with the Damage would be there, and we would just hang with Big's whole crew and just drink 40, smoke, and talk. As it grew to the point of him finally getting the, the finishing touches on the album, he gave me a call and said, hey, man, I just need that one last record for the streets because I got my radio record. It's called Juicy. And actually, Pete Rock played it for me. Shout out to Pete. And once I heard it, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to work. And this is before I did radio. And he said, I just need one for the streets. I said, big, right now, I don't have time to even do anything right now. And he goes, come on, man, I, did, I don't care what you use. It could be impeached a president. I don't care, which is one of the most classic breaks of, of hip hop. I said, all right. I'm going to use that. Come come meet me at the at the studio. He comes to d and I have one note, which is just a boop, and, and, and the drums, and I have the pattern. He says, that's all you got? I said, no, I'm going to put it on different tones and put them on every pad on the drum machine because that's, you know, uh, numerous pads on it. And I just tune them. Boop, 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 boop. And, and then I said, okay, now let me program <laughs> and and then uh, I then and I remember when I heard the what with him and Meth, I was like, yo man, this is one of the greatest records. As simple as it is, I just kept hearing Biggie Smalls is the illest from that, and I said, let me put that down and see if that can intro it. So I did the Biggie Smalls, Biggie 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 Smalls, and just triggered it on a button, and he and he just sat around drinking, smoking. The whole Junior Mafia is there. We're having a good time, just chilling. But now hours and hours are passing. It's getting to that point where money's being spent and no one's doing anything. I'm like, big man, you've been here for almost nine hours. You want to come back tomorrow? He goes, oh, I'm ready. Like, we haven't written anything down. He goes, oh, no, I got it up in here. He goes in the room and goes, live from Bedford Stuyvesant. And the live is when we're like, oh, man. <laughs> and unbelievable was born. Was and there then, any doubt? Because I guess Big shows up to the studio and you're, do, do, you're doing this thing. Did he, was he like, did he just trust you? It was like whatever you created, he was just going to rap on it? Or? He was the one that told me on the hook, change it up. Oh. So, you know, on the hook, it goes. Ba -dun, ba -dun, ba -dun, ba -dun, dun, dun. He told me to do that. 
And then he even said, uh, when I said it, I meant it. Bite my tongue for no one. Call me uh, evil, unbelievable. He actually said, switch it on that part of the of the line. So I said, boom, 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 just in that one spot because he told me to do it. Yeah. And he told he gave me the scratch. So classic. So you and I have a classic connection to a Biggie song. Absolutely, absolutely. Which I'm I'm so grateful for to even have this story to tell as part of my stories you know yeah, what i mean yeah. that i'm connected in this way i'm mm-hmm. grateful to be connected in any way to anything on no this question. project yeah. you know what i'm saying so Absolutely. the fact that we have this uh this story is so special to me which honestly i forgot about for many many years and i probably have told the story wrong since you kind of t- mentioned it to me right so just the, so 10 crack commandments yes was originally a, a promo for my show. Hot, the hot five and nine. Hot five and nine. So I had a countdown show. It was at nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. I had dope ass promos. Your promos like records. I had, I mean, Lauren Hill, the Fugees, Wu Tang, everybody Mom was making D, promos. People were you. making promos. Yeah. So that the top of the the thing it would start with yeah. these promos. So you made a promo for me for the hot five and nine. Jay yep. with the damager. Mm-hmm. It's the hop. How, how, I don't remember how uh, it went. And, uh, uh, it's the uh, Caliente Cinco El Nuevo on Hot 97 with Angie Martinez. That's why. That's, that's why, why it stops at nine. And that's why the scratch when the beat comes in, it only goes to five. One, two, two, three, four, five. Then I do it again. One, two, two, three, 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 four, five. Because I'm saying just doing the five. Yeah. And then you know just being creative on some DJ, you know, type of thing. So uh, the fact that you made me a beat from my promo for my <laughs> feature on my show. Oh yeah. The DJ premiere made a beat like that's yeah. such great and, times and in hip hop. Like, everybody wanted to be on your show. Like you, you for one you were new, and and you just you were just it's like. Who does not love Angie? No. That's just how it was. Yeah. Seriously, like during that during that era, the era of the '90s, and so so many people were doing so many ill promos, and like I said, they sound like records. They didn't sound like just a basic promo. They would sound like joints that you could play in a club. Yeah, or, fire. Just, yeah. So yeah, yeah. when it came down to uh, doing one for you, you, you ran. You know, you did random ones at different days. Uh, Puff was up there as your guest, and um, you played it. And he heard it. And one of my homies shout out to my man Danny. Danny called me and goes, Yo, and this is when we had beepers. And I had a, and, uh, He beeped he, you? He beeped me. <laughs> I and thought Puff was in the car. So Puff was at the he station. He was at the and station as a guest. You, you know, he used to just pop up at any time. Yeah, yeah. He was often just, on the show. And just mm-hmm. run the show. So it was just one of those days. Danny's beeping me, going, Yo, turn on Hot 97. Puff's telling you to call him. I'm like, What? He goes, Yeah, he's telling you to call him. He's on there going, Yo, preview pre- out there. Call Hot 97, and of course, y'all always gave us the warm line yeah. back then, so we could call the, the direct line to the station. And uh, I'm, I'm listening now. I turn it on. I'm driving, and uh, y'all are just kicking the regular talking, but I don't hear him say anything. And then right when you go, well, we're going to go to a song and or we'll take a commercial break, something like that. And he goes, he goes, okay, Premier, call me. So now I hear it. So I call. He's like, yo, we need that J. Rue joint. And I, at the time, there was tension with J. Ru and Puff and them, them because we had a record called One Day that that was on his second album that uh, offended a lot of people and it was very direct. So at that time, we're, going, we're definitely getting into that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they had already had the conversation, so uh, all of that already happened. But still, moving forward, he was like, I said, well, you and Ru don't get along, and that's really was for Angie. So if if you don't get along with Ru. I'm not gonna give the beat up, and but uh, he's like, man, we really want that. He got this idea called the Ten Crack Commandments. He wants to do it to that. I was like, well, let me call Rue. I called Jay Rue, and he goes, this is his exact reply. He goes, oh man, that's hip hop. Let him have it, no charge. And I was like, that's dope. Like, you know, instead of having the tension, he's like, nah, that's. Why hip-. do you think he said that? Cause him and Big, all of us were so cool with each other. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we we you know we we were ignorant and and wild at at at, at a certain part of that part of our career. And um, you know when we did the record that offended you know so many people on it when we dropped it, um, it was at a time where we were you know kind of being selfish for what happened at the Source Awards. So because of that, we were just like, you know, everybody's got stand up from New York. I'm not from New York originally. Everybody knows I'm from Texas originally, but 
for all the stripes I've earned and all the years I've been here, we just, at the time, it, it, looking back, it, it was the right move for Puff to just say, let's be cool and not start any drama. We're in front of an audience of people. Everybody's watching, it's televised. It's the first televised Source Awards. We don't need to wild out, you know? So he really, looking back, made the right move. Yeah. Where we were like, nah, nah, wild out. But Puff, I know. Made, the, Puff made the right call. We definitely got to go down that road. I definitely have a bunch yeah. of questions about Yeah, he that made the time. right call, so shout to Puff. How did that work with that beat, though? So Big thought Jay Wu was like this and him, but he really yeah, wasn't. Yeah, but because what it was, it was a sta- it was a look at how hip hop looks right now, you know. So what it was is he said he said he said uh, smack dab in the middle was hip hop with a Versace suit on. So the first thing he's thinking, well, I'm wearing Versace. No, he's coming but, for but me. But Pac was wearing Versace. I yeah. mean, a lot of people were wearing. Some of our homies that don't even rap were wearing Versace. Versace. So. We're saying the the new pit, the new look and uniform of hip hop artists is wearing Versace and more shiny stuff. When y'all keep saying you're repping the street, yeah, there was a whole at time of that. Everybody was there was, a, there was like a evolution happening and mm-hmm. like a shininess coming. Yeah. Not just shiny suit, but you know extravagance and mm-hmm. and and you know yeah. all that name brands and all that. And yeah. then there was a portion of hip hop that was like. Anti that, and right. Jay Rue kind of represented Absolutely, that. Absolutely, because he was all about righteousness, and I mean, you know, he drank, and you know, everybody in the hip hop contradicts himself in some type of way. But during that time, when he and and first of all, when we made the record, it wasn't even a plan. We were just working on another beat. Mm-hmm. It just happened to be the day after the Source Awards, and after after the Source Awards, we went to uh, the tunnel that night. And Suge and all of them are there partying and everything. We're like, wow, whole Death Rose here dancing on the floor. And it was packed. So the next day, we just had a regular session. And so when when J. Roo laid that down, it, we thought it was just going to be just for some some jokes just in our inner circle. And uh, he's like, let's put this out. And I'm like, yeah. This, yeah. What's the name of this record again? One Day. This is One Day. Yeah, so when when he did that... He's like, uh, you know, if we, do you want to put it out? And I was like, well, being it's so short, uh, maybe this would be the first leak before we drop our first single, which was, was called You're Playing Yourself. Yeah, I remember. And, and, and even that, there was rumblings that we were doing that to diss players' anthem, which we weren't. I just happened to have the same sample. Clark Kent beat me to it with Players Anthem, and it was so dope. So yeah, so Players Anthem comes out. We're like, woo, this is hot. Biggie already feels like J. Ru is sideways right. coming at him. Right. And then you use the same sample and do a song called and You flip Playing it back Yourself. With, yeah, and, and, and you say with that big Willie Tall. Yeah. With all, all that. that uh, you know, with the with, with this, the hooker type clothes. Yeah. They're thinking So Kim. Big's like, yo, this guy yeah. really is coming for me in all these songs. No relation. It's just if you think like that, yeah. that's that's what it was, but it wasn't, you know. Yeah. So when so when you call J. Rue to say is is it okay for Big to have this beat? He really wasn't holding any kind nah, of resentment nah, at all. No, nah. he he because like, he wanted to talk to Big. He was like, "Yo, man, let me talk to him." I'm like, "Right now, I don't think it's the right time. It's still too much tension. Maybe when things subside." And obviously, plus we didn't think he was gonna pass. So I, I figured, you know, let some months pass. Let him drop uh, his album, do what he do. We run into each other one day, and y'all could talk it out because. Like I said, there's many pictures of Jay Rue in different clothes, different uh, outfits that him and Big together. The best part of that whole thing was when we got the uh, call that Puff had left a message. He said, here's my house phone, my car phone, my office phone, here's my boat phone. We were like, damn, he got a boat phone. <laughs> <laughs> like, Puff is large, you know what I'm saying? But. But, you know, they had the conversation and even it kind of re-escalated when we were working on kicking the door on life after death. And Big was like, yeah, well, look at me. That wasn't a, that wasn't a conversation. That was a, 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 an argument. I was like, yeah, but it had nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. And he's like, eh, well, he said the guy had a Versace suit on. I'm like, dude, but you're not the only one wearing a Versace suit. But, you know. Can you just clearly paint the picture for me again and just tell me that the Ten Crack Commandments is finished. The lyrics are done. Yeah. You watched the whole thing happen, right? Mm-hmm. I was still, still right there, and then, because he was in, a, he would rhyme in a wheelchair, so he'd use the walker to yeah. get to the um, to the booth, and they would help him, like you know, because he would walk slow, and then once he got to the booth, he would get sit in the wheelchair and rhyme. So once it was over, he goes, "Preem, it's over," just like that. I was just in that tone, he goes, "I'm the greatest," mm. and and I just kind of looked like, "Wow, the, done," you know what I'm saying? And then. Mm. 
Not to, you know, after seeing the movie and there's a scene of that, but there's playing Sky's the Limit instead of Crack Commandments, even though they use Crack Commandments in the early part of the movie mm -hmm. when his son was learned how to, how to sling. And um, obviously they use it for that particular part. But, it, but when I saw the Sky's and the fact that that scene, you know, they could have maybe not even done that scene. Yeah. But when he said, I'm the greatest and, and all that, and Gravy did such a good job being big in there. Yeah, and and uh, But I was like, so it, wrong but, song. <laughs> when he said it, though, in that moment, did you... Um... Kind of got a little chill. You know? Yeah, I did. I almost looked at him almost like, wow. And and not because he was leaving, just... It was just a weird chill I got. I really did. What do you think the impact of that song was on the culture at that time? It was really big. Um, two things. You know, Chuck D was uh, 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 was offended by the record because... <clears throat> I had seen an interview with him way back before, probably before Nation of Millions even came out, mm -hmm. way before Don't Believe the Hype. <clears throat> and, and Chuck said, if anybody ever scratches my voice, that's fine. As long as it's not on a record that has to deal with drugs, <clears throat> sex, uh, you know, just anything of that, you know, because he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he's not into any of that. And we all, we all know that's how Chuck D is. Don't, don't play around. I gave... Big a warning to when we did the record. I said, "Yo," because again, we did it for you, so we didn't have anything to worry about for the high five. My promo was clean. There was yeah. no drugs. There was no sex. <laughs> was, there was no just water. There was no drug <laughs> commandments. It just the water. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> so you know, a little Poland Spring or something. But mm -hmm. but uh, when Chuck it, D never tried to sue me. No, nah, no, nah, you were, you were in the clear. <laughs> so once the record came out, and again, and we didn't know Big was gonna pass. He said, I said, Big, you, uh, this is real talk. He said, I said, yo, man, Chuck's not going to like this because it's 10 crack commandments. He goes, you know what? I'll deal with Chuck. He told me he would deal with it. And I was like, all right, cool. So then he passes. And then, the, you know, the legal, the legal stuff comes through with the paperwork saying that that has to be removed. And we had to go, you know, it, it was it, it didn't go over the extreme. We had to go to court or anything. It was settled out. But. The the part that always messed me up was he said, Preem, I'll deal with it. And I was like, all right. Man, I wasn't even worried about it. I, I even looked at it like, man, Big is so convincing and such a sweetheart. He'll be able to even tell Chuck, yo, 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 yo. He'll, he'll, go, he'll call you Paul, like baby Paul. He'll go, Paul. <laughs> yo, Paul. You know, he, he, that, that's what he it's always say, yo, Paul. And I know I can see him doing that to Chuck. <laughs> but, you thought you know, Chuck was gonna fold for that? <laughs> Who knows? It's big. <laughs> you know, it, it just, he he was just that cool of a dude where he's and that convincing. Mm -hmm. Big. So yeah. he said he would deal with it. And so when I remember when I got the paperwork, I was like, damn it. You know, what am I gonna do now? You know, but but Puff was cool um with helping me split it down the middle. So Chuck was suing you? The, everybody, the, the the label, the, the publisher, and the estate, everything, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, me and Chuck had some some words because I I, I just figured, nah, he's gone, I, he can't really get to get us out of this, and I held a grudge for a minute, and then Jam Master Jay passed away, and we were going to his wake, so when we went to, and I had just lost my homie headquarters, and, and um, we go look and look at his body in the casket, and right when we're leaving, somebody touched me on the shoulder, and it was Chuck. And I immediately, because he said, can I talk to you for a second? Immediately, I said, I love you, bro. Don't worry about it. it I'm, I'm done with it. And we hugged real tight. Me and Chuck have been the best of friends ever since. Wow. Yeah. And, and like I said, we we settled out and, you know, and, and Puff man, split it with me halfway. So he was like, yo, I got you. And, and Puff came through on his end for big. And I came through on my end for my part. So mm -hmm. The one thing, too, I would like to get back to, too, is just like, the uniqueness of Big mm -hmm. and why he stood out to everybody so mu so much and and for you who had seen so many greats and mm -hmm. worked with so many greats and right. and really firsthand got to to see all of that. Yeah. What do you think? What Ma do you think was the magic of Big? Like, if you could explain. For me, that. I, I remember this. KRS once said this on a record called "Health, Wealth, and Knowledge of Self." He said, sell your image, never sell a record. He said, image gets respected. He said, records come and go and get collected. And some to the magnitude, he said, uh, even records that went, you know, went pop or could now be found for like a dollar in a thrift shop. You know what I'm saying? Like it could have been a platinum album. Now it's just worth a dollar. And I kind of understand where he, you know, I not kind of understand where he's coming from because your image and everything that you promote with that 
has to match everything else you carry with it. And just seeing Big, he had a, just a unique look, you know, the lazy eye going all over the place. And and then his natural person personality, aside from music, matched the, the records. You know, I've always uh, said I like when an artist looks like EPMD, with the fisherman hat and all that, their records, they look they look like the records. I feel like me and Guru Gangstar, when you hear our records, they look like us. They sound like the way we look. Mm -hmm. Big, same thing. Every record he made from from Nasty Boy to, to like you said, Lead to Kiss Your Ass, Good Night, good night to Kicking the Door, Ten Crack Commandments, everything looks like Big. And, and, and he knew what to pick based off, even the Bone Thugs record, oof. Mm. He's even that. It was like, yo, this motherfucker killing anything he's a part of mm -hmm. and knows how to turn into whatever that track is is uh, set up for him to spit his mm -hmm. yeah. You can't deny the connection between Ten Crack Commandments and the trap, coke, and drill subgenres of today's rap scene. Just like we can't forget how a decade ago, Rick Ross connected with Diddy to channel some of that B.I.G. magic. Oh. Edge, what's up with you? You know, I'm good. Working, still working, taking care of my sh But I definitely would love no, to see you, man. You. I'm glad at least we get to do this today. I mean, we all got to look at an artist like you and see some of Big's DNA in there and the influence. And so I'm curious from your perspective, just what, what he meant to you. Like, when was the first time you heard him? How did it affect you? My first... Big Listen had to be juicy. It had to be one of his huge records that hit Miami. And when it hit Miami, that's when I personally went back and dug up certain things. And I remember when I first heard Big, um, I was like, damn, you know, what, what's, what's homie name? It's Biggie Smalls. And I remember I went and bought a cassette or something of another Biggie Smalls or when I got and played it, it wasn't big or whatever it oh, was. Oh, no. And yeah, yeah, yeah. When I first listened to Big, and that's when the, you know, the clarification came for me. It was notorious B.I.G. Okay, boom, yeah. that's what the play was. And, you know, that's when Craig Mack was taking off Big. He separated himself from everybody. Yeah. How old were you? I want to say you maybe young. 18 to 19 years old. Yeah. Had you already, like committed to like you want to be a rapper i had right? i most definitely had began writing my own rhymes you know committing time to the to the sport but after seeing big it was like damn it's real you know what i'm saying he most <laughs> definitely pushed yeah. that button in rose without a doubt there is a thing there is a connection to him being a big dude and being fly yeah yeah and and crispy and wearing you know yeah, yeah. High-end luxury clothing. Without a doubt. I'm sure that had to influence you in some way. Without, without a doubt. And it, it went so well with the wordplay. You got to remember me being a youngster, watching heavy set dudes come up in the game. It was like they always wanted a dude to be entertainment, a fat dude to be funny. Or, you know what I'm saying? They want to see you as the fat boys. And when Big came, this shit was real. This shit was serious. You know, this shit was sincere. Them big coogee sweaters was something else, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, and it was player. It wasn't. It wasn't oh, funny. It wasn't nothing funny. It was nothing funny. Yeah. Everything was to be taken extremely serious, and that's most <laughs> definitely what touched me the most about Big, his stature, his demeanor, his wordplay. Homie was so powerful. He made his little homies be taken serious. Just took Junior Mafia serious, like you know what I'm saying? Like oh, so what? Finna get some money, boy. You know, and it's very few people who would have been able to bring that out of you, but that's what the homie did. Yes, and now, now, I mean, that you know, when you first hit her big, you 18 years old and you started your journey down writing rhymes, but now as this seasoned, super successful artist, do you have a different type of appreciation for what Oh, oh, without a doubt. What he was able to put together? Yeah. W without a doubt, you know what I mean? And when I think about this perspective, this would almost bring a tear out of Rose eye when he think about B.I.G. was the fact that did we understand how young Big was? Did we understand the age the homie was when he was 
you know, creating these bodies of work, when he had the attention of not just the rap game, but the entire world, these young dudes was 23 years old. No, that's it's crazy. unbelievable. <laughs> like, you know, this is what was going on. Yeah. That was like, damn. You know, and that's one of them things that when I'm with, with Puff, yo, like, you know, you know, I understand how, you know, he get deep when I ask him B.I.G. questions. So I kind of understand it and respectfully ask him when we alone. You know what I mean? Because homie may take five minutes to respond to one of my questions and, you know, that's just one of them errors. Or if I could have been a fly on the wall or in the room with that one dude, it would have been. Bigger. Um, a lot of people will say that you know some of the greats that we have now, and some of the, you you still hear Big's DNA in terms of the influence and and just how he touched everything. Do you include yourself in that? Like, do do we see Big DNA in some Ross records? I'm sure, without a doubt. And that's not the, the several records where I leaned on Big or I, I made sure you heard his influence like on the, my no, Nobody collaboration featuring French Montana or any other records I had Puff do the intros in and so on and so forth. But most definitely, I'm sure that's what it is. Because when I yeah. sit down and I reflect on my greatest moments in, in hip-hop, B.I.G. is um what comes... Do you have a do you have a favorite rec a favorite song or a favorite verse on Life After Death? For one, you know, more money, more problem. It was just most definitely one of those explosive, youthful, fun records. That was just mm -hmm. that whole bad boy vibe. That's what I loved. I love how Big was able to be his own face, be his own boss, but he also carried that bad boy flag. You know what I mean? Puff put me on. I'm finna take it there, and he made it seem so effortless. Mm -hmm. These he dudes, wasn't afraid these, to have fun. These dudes now can't even carry their own. Big yeah. carry bad boy <laughs> flag, you know his own flag and Junior Mafia. And when you think of that title, more money, more problems, is it just it means so much more even now. Mm -hmm. It's like what the yeah. this would come with it. <laughs> The little homie only 23 years old, 24 years old, on top of the world. Him and Tupac had the whole world in a frenzy, going back and forth. These two 23-year-olds just got their driver's license really good. Just wrecked their first Land Cruisers. Yeah. It's really crazy when you think about that age. Oh, man. When you think about that now, when you think about the young artists now, like, yo... Now you got to imagine the, the whole rap game on their back. Could they carry that? Of course not. Do you think albums now could still have that type of impact and last so long? I think the question is, has it been one? No. Mm. No. Really? And nobody, nobody's achieved and accomplished what Big did in two projects. Mm. Now we equate that with the age. It's unbelievable. You feel what me? are we it's even talking about? What are we even talking about here? <laughs> he most definitely gave me the confidence and gave me a, a whole new vision as far as what the game needed, what the game was missing, and, one, and when we lost big, more importantly, what we now missing. What This what the game missing. It'll never be another B.I.G., but we know what the game missing. He just goes to the booth and he's like, uh, uh. This goes out the cats, fingers in their ass again, $20 half a man. I don't like talking about it, you know? I still deal with that to this day, you know? They say time heal wounds, it don't heal it for me. Biggie's dead because Pac lied. 